Today is the Feast of the Transfiguration, and on this day we read a couple of transfiguration stories, if you will. The word transfiguration is a fancy term that means transformed, okay, to be transformed into something. In the Hebrew Scripture story, we see the story of Moses. Moses is transformed when he comes into, into contact with the presence of God. He doesn't know he is. He comes down the mountain and everyone says, Moses, what's up with your face? And he was glowing from the presence of God. Moses returns to God, veils his face, comes back down the mountain, unveils his face. The disciples are changed after their encounter with the holy as well. Jesus takes them to the top of the mountain and there... They fought sleep, but were awake enough to see Jesus with two visitors, Moses and Elijah. If you know the story, you'll know that Moses and Elijah represent the story of the law and the prophets. Moses was the giver of the law. Elijah was the greatest of the prophets. So you have the law and the prophets, the two pillars of Judaism, being brought together in Jesus. Okay, so there's a symbolic message here. Uh, There's also another symbolic message, and that is after about eight days... That's a throwaway phrase, right? After about eight days. What is the number eight? What happened in seven days? The creation, right? Six days and one Sabbath. The eighth day is when we talk about the new creation. Something new is being created here. Something new is coming up. This is the gospel writer's way of giving us uh, a special message about something new being created on the eighth day. So after about eight days, he brings them to the mountain. They see Moses and Elijah, and they walk through a cloud, and they hear the voice of God says, This is my beloved, my chosen. Listen to him. And they set their eyes toward Jerusalem. Now, Peter, of course, is so excited because Peter is wanting to be excited. And Peter says, God, this is fantastic. Let's just build a booth for each of you and stay here. And this is wonderful and it'll be great. And Jesus says, no, we've got to head to Jerusalem. Now, it wasn't about going to Jerusalem. That's another key word in the Gospels. A phrase, setting their eyes on Jerusalem means Holy Week. That's what Jerusalem was, Holy Week. So he was coming down the mountain to die, and he knew it. This was the creation of the last phase of his ministry, which is why the church makes the Feast of Transfiguration today as we begin the Lenten journey. It's not coincidental. Encounters changed Moses, and encounters changed the disciples as well. Encounters change us, or they should at least if they're authentic encounters. Let me give you some examples. You meet the one. You know the one. Maybe it was in high school or college or on a blind date or wherever it was that you met. And on that moment, your life changes forever. Maybe it was when you looked into the eyes of your children for the very first time, and you would never be the same. Maybe it was when you just met someone who was different than you, maybe someone that you had never experienced before, and maybe someone that you had been told would be something, or your mind or society had told you would be something, and then you meet them and realize they're not who I thought they were at all. This could be a refugee or an immigrant or a homeless person. It could be a, an LGBT person or a person of color. This is why I think travel and education are so important in our society because those opportunities give us opportunities for growth and encounter that change our worldview. We know, for instance, that people who travel and experience other cultures have an appreciation that goes beyond their own. There's something about meeting folk who look and act differently than us that make us think, hmm, maybe it's not where I want my life to be, but I get it. I understand them now, and I respect them more. And when our worldview changes, when our worldview expands, I think it often makes us better people. We become more understanding. We become more compassionate. But what about encounters with the holy? 
Do we really expect them today? I I thought about that a lot this week because uh, as I read the Scriptures on Monday, one of the things that struck me in a way I hadn't remembered it before in the Scripture is the intentionality about encountering the holy. Holy expectations. Do we really expect to meet God? Or is our religion just something that's comfortable for us and that we like? I was born and raised, as many of you know, in the United Methodist tradition. It is where I was ordained and served as a pastor for many years. What you may not know is that back in the early 70s, my mother left the United Methodist Church for what was the real church. It was the charismatic movement of the early 1970s. Uh, closely aligned with the Pentecostal movement, the charismatic movement became all the rage in the early and mid-70s. And so my mom went there, and I went with her, and it wasn't my cup of tea. I'll be honest with you. When people start doing this, I kind of want to do this. It's just not, for, it's not wrong. It's just not for me. I'm much more comfortable with smells and bells than I am with, with that. You get, yeah, smells and bells. I am, I am the, if you Google God's frozen chosen, I am who shows up, Okay. This is more my style. It doesn't make other styles wrong. It's just not what feeds me. And so I went back to United Methodist Church as a teenager when I was able to find a ride back on my own. But there was something about the gift of the charismatic church that I carry with me today. And I think, I think I've lost it. And I think I needed to be reminded. And this week reminded me. And I want to pass that on to you. In the charismatic church, they expected to meet the holy And they expected the holy to transform them in some way. And I think that's a gift. I wonder if in the progressive church we're not so bent on theology and the proper way of doing things and being involved in social justice that we've forgotten where our heart meets the holy as well. One of the faults I would give the charismatic church movement, the Pentecostal church movement, is they're so involved in their heart and their emotions and their little wonderful experiences, personal relationship with Jesus, that they're not real good on heavy theology and and, and really thinking about their faith in ways that make a difference in the world around them. But I wonder if we're just not as guilty in the opposite way. The progressive church doesn't often expect encounters with God to transform lives. What about us? Do we expect to meet God in worship or just do we come because we like our friends and the building's pretty and Pastor Rob is nice and the music's good? All that's right. Well, Pastor Rob isn't nice, but I pretend. But do we really expect to encounter God? Do we expect something to happen in our time together in which we meet the Holy Spirit in a way that is life-giving and life-transforming? Do we expect to feel God's presence in prayer? Not just here, but in our own life. Do we expect to encounter something in the Scriptures? I did this week as I read for this. In a way that makes me see God in a new and fresh way that I needed to be reminded I've not seen God that way in a while. If you've not seen the movie... The Eyes of Tammy Faye, you need to see the movie The Eyes of Tammy Faye. Jessica Chastain does an amazing job of playing Tammy Faye, and there's an important part of the story, I think, in which Tammy Faye's mother, when she was a young girl, did not want her to go to church. It's not that she didn't want her to be Christian, because she was Christian. She was the piano player for their local Pentecostal church. She didn't want Tammy Faye to go because... The mother had been divorced, and Tammy was from her first marriage. And she didn't want the church to be reminded of her divorce, and Tammy was a reminder of that divorce. One day, beyond beyond her mother's back, she snuck into the church. While she was there, she had an experience of the Spirit of God. She was touched by God's presence in a holy and real way. And the entire church, instead of being ashamed and shaming the mother, the mother said, Tammy Faye, you've got to leave now. And they said, don't you stop her. God is in that girl right now, and she was sent for a reason. It's an important moment because when God met the people, they were changed. You may know I teach a world religions class at Hagerstown Community College as well as teaching German there. And this past week... 
I, I, I showed my students a video on the religion known as Sikhism or Sikhi. It's a, a monotheistic faith that comes from India. So it's sort of a, a monotheistic version in some ways of influenced by Hinduism. And one of the, I showed them the video of, of about 10 minute video of, of Sikhs going to worship. What does it mean to worship in a Sikh religion? Because in this class, we talk about what people believe, how they act, how their faith informs their world, but you don't really see them at worship. And it's such an important part of seeing what people do. And one of the things they did is that when they enter their holy space, they take off their shoes. I was reminded how when I was on sabbatical in Nepal at Kathmandu, at the Gompa, when we entered the Gompa, which is the holy hall, the sanctuary of the monastery, we all removed our shoes. You would never wear shoes in the holy space. Why? Remember the story of Moses from our own tradition? Among many, many spiritual traditions, when you are on holy ground, you remove your shoes. When Moses encountered the holy in the burning bush, he was told, take off your shoes, for the place on which you stand is holy ground. I flashed back to that little charismatic church that my mother went to when I was a child, and I remember many, many times when people there would take off their shoes in worship. And it wasn't because their feet were more comfortable. Well, that may have been part of it. It was because something happened in their life that in that moment they felt God. And they just felt like they wanted to honor the humility of that moment of being in the presence of the holy. And so they removed their shoes. Not something we do. Not something I'm going to ask us to do. Don't worry. I don't care if you have holes in your socks. We're not going to know today. My point is this, have we somehow forgotten what it means to expect the holy in our worship and in our encounters with God? Why do we vest for worship? I dress funny than the rest of you, funnier than the rest of you when I come to church. Why? As a reminder that this is a holy place. The room we're in is called sanctuary, which means holy place, right? Sanctus, the word for, for holy. We are not at the Rotary. We are not at Kiwanis or the Lions Club breakfast. They're nice places, don't get me wrong, I enjoy them. But this is different. This place is holy. This moment is sacred. This God we intend to meet is one who can and should transform our lives if we allow it to be so. The problem is that encounters with the holy can be inconvenient, and they can be dangerous. Encounters with the holy can change us, and sometimes they can just put a kink in our plans. Ask Mary. Ask John the Baptist. Ask any of the apostles. But encountering God does empower us. It can challenge us. It can stretch us. It can cause us to grow in very powerful ways. When this church said yes to making a home for the homeless here every day of the week, lives began to change. And I need to tell you, not just for those people, but for this people right here too. When I walk down the street with my friends for lunch and a homeless person says, hey, Pastor Rob, how you doing? You know him? Oh yeah, that's so-and-so and he's a really nice guy. Lives change when we meet folk in a new way, don't they? I expect lives will change for us as well as we welcome a refugee family. I expect lives will change for us as we make safe space for someone who is starting a new life because, frankly, they're not safe in their old one. This week, it's become abundantly clear that Afghans are probably not the only refugees we're going to be working with as Ukrainians are fle fleeing their country. Change. It's uncomfortable. But sometimes it makes God come to us in a new and relevant way. Lent is that time of preparation. It's the time when we encounter the Holy, the Spirit of God, not perfunctorily, but expectantly. As a church, we can say, God, bless our plans. This is what we want to do. Or we can say, God, make us open to your plan and help us to be empowered to follow what you call us to be. 
So I ask us, as we prepare these last few days, how will Lent be a time of expectation for us in this church? How will we be intentional about opening our lives to the transformational power of the Holy Spirit? How will we tune our ears to hear what God is saying to us and to the church, and not just to hear them, but to be transformed by them? Because that is what it means to expect the holy in our world, in our church, and in us. Amen.